Excellent. So again, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining today's SIC ECHO session. Uh, very excited to have Dr. Christine Jones with us today, who is a palliative care physician, educator, and longtime advocate for excellence in palliative care. She's currently the medical director of the Victoria Hospice and has been a consulting palliative care physician to patients and families at hospice in community um, and as well as with the Island Health Community and health, Home and Community Health teams in acute care and also in long term care. She's a master facilitator for LEAP, which many of you know and probably also participate in. And she's also a master facilitator for the Serious Illness Conversation Guide. Um, she has uh, supported and, and mentored students, residents, and fellows. Um, and we are delighted and excited to have her today for our SIC ECHO updates and innovations training for SIC facilitators and clinicians. Before we get started officially, I'd also like to acknowledge that the BC Centre for Palliative Care sits on what is colonially known as New Westminster, which is the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and the, oh, my brain just stopped, and the, one more group, who are you guys? Uh, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam Nations. We recognize that you are all joining from across the province and that you are on the traditional territories of a number of Indigenous groups and that from coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory for all Inuit, Métis and First Nations people who call this land their home. So with that, I will hand over to Dr. Jones and I think you're in for an interesting and interactive uh, afternoon. Hello, everybody. And I'm just going to check in with uh, Tina that you guys can hear me okay. Thumbs up, everybody. Yeah, great. Yeah, okay, perfect. So um, I'm so pleased to be talking to you about the Serious Illness Conversation. I first heard about the Serious Illness Conversation when Rachel Brunecki presented it to a group of uh, learners um, in Boston uh, that I just, by luck, happened to be there. And I, so I was part of one of the focus groups uh, for the Serious Illness Conversation when she was trying to determine best language. And so I've been really excited to see it from that early stage to become the widely used and useful tool that it is. And one of the reasons that I may or may not come across as a bit clustered uh, today it's because I'm I'm sitting at a Starbucks right now, close to a home uh, where I visited someone in Langford, and uh, I was called in uh, because of nausea and vomiting. And what I find is often the case for me as a palliative care doc is that the hook is a symptom of some sort, but what becomes the meat um, of the visit is uh, the serious illness conversation, which may be somewhat modified uh, for the place and the time and the people around, but I don't think there is a single, well, there's very few visits that I do that I don't incorporate the serious illness conversation. So there you go. So I'm a, a convert and I'm trying to uh, forward my slides, but I'm having a little, oh, there we go. It's just a little bit of a delay. And so, um, what I wanted to start with is really presenting you with a case, and then we might reflect back to this case. Um, we might talk about our own uh, experiences, but this is a patient, um, and I, I don't wanna spend too much time on the background, but really dive right into the serious in this conversation. So this patient's understanding was that her kidneys aren't working as well as they should be because of her history of high blood pressure. And oh, her information preferences are just really wanting to take things one day at a time, which was very much the case of my patient today, information in very small amounts. Her prognostic awareness was that she was gonna get better, that uh, she was gonna get a ah. transplant. And her hopes and fears were to travel to the Louvre, to that she, that she feared about being a burden on her daughter and continue along walks on the waterfront. Her strengths was her ability to laugh at herself and other uh, people and situations and her connection to God. 
and her critical abilities were sharing meals with friends and families. She was willing to continue dialysis and um, uh, go to the ICU. Her family really didn't want to talk about it and neither did she really want to burden them with conversations. And um, we, what we decided at that time was to hold this, just to hold this conversation and continue to connect and potentially repeat the conversation about what's most important as time went by. And when she was ready, we would have a family meeting and talk. And so this was, this represents one of the real series in those conversations that I had, and it may not follow through um, with what might be the primary goal of a series on this conversation, which is to inform care planning. But I'm going to bring some slides in a little bit later that talks about what is our role in having these conversations upstream and, and how do we work with these early conversations to help shepherd people along in their illness to take deaths from being something imaginary in the future to becoming more and more proximate and less and less scary. And I think that's one of my roles as a palliative care physician is to shepherd with repeated conversations about where people are at, remapping where they are, what's we're in a new place now and moving on to the next step. So why I love the serious illness conversation, of course, it's the basis for shared decision-making and nowhere else I think does it better in the literature than the renal program. Actually, the, the, re, the renal literature is filled with the importance of the um, shared decision-making. For me, it's a bit therapeutic bedside uh, intervention first and foremost. I practice my therapeutic listening and my therapeutic presence, trying to provide a safe space for emotion and um, to, to be brought forward, questions to be answered uh, that may not find the light of day without uh, really uh, skillful uh, use of silence and communication. Trying to understand their adaptive coping mechanisms, and I know there's lots of psychosocial people in the room uh, that will understand this better than I and support me in, in, um, in helping patients through those pieces, but really ultimately facilitating holistic care, psychosocial, spiritual, practical, physical, um, and on. So I just recalled, uh, because of my flustered state, that really we were going to do a poll. And that poll was to really to find out who's in the room and uh, where the, the circumstances under which we practice. So Tina, I wonder if you could bring up the first poll, please. All right, that poll is launched. Folks can see it. There we go. <laughs> So it looks like most of us are nurses. There's a few nurses and psychosocial clinicians here, lovely. And I'm so pleased that we've got spiritual care and admin support staff and someone who recognizes or who identifies as an educator and other. And I'm curious if someone can pop in the yeah. chat what their other is, our three out of 36 that I didn't think of as part of the team. Anyway, so maybe maybe that will come up. So it says share results. Is that good? Is that something I'm supposed to do? I just clicked on it. Yeah, there we go. Oh, now everyone can see it. Okay. Yeah. So maybe we can uh, launch the next poll, please. I care for patients on dialysis, not at all, sometimes, often, exclusively. Oh, so I just let, I see now, Tina, I let a certain amount of time go by and then I end it? Yeah, or we, yeah, we can end it ahead of time um, if we see that everybody's answered or is close to answering. Okay. 34 of 37 folks, 35, that's probably. I see, okay, so I'm gonna end the poll now yep. and share the results. You bet. And so what we see is that we have a, a, a gamut of some people, interestingly, who only look after patients on dialysis, 
And often that's about 53% and then about 60% or, or so that are less often involved. And, uh, and the next poll, let's see the next piece. I am comfortable asking the questions in a serious illness conversation. And so if we could say true, mostly true, a little bit true or not true at all. So we're not getting any not true at all. Um, which is interesting given how, uh, this must be the converted <laughs> that we have here, uh, because I know there's a lot of people that don't uh, proceed with the serious illness conversation because of uh, the discomfort around asking the questions that it's serious illness conversation. What I should have asked is how many are comfortable giving prognosis? That's a whole other story, but we'll get to that in a little bit. I'm gonna end that poll now and share the results. Um, a little bit true, mostly true, and 100% true, yay! 40% of people are comfortable asking those questions, love it. Especially since we are in a uh, interprofessional group right now. So it keeps coming up, share results, and I do that, and then it says stop sharing. So I don't know why it's giving me- Want me to go to the next one? Yes, please, okay. yeah. Yeah, I think we need to stop sharing. Okay. And then, so here's the que another question. So which clinicians have a potential role in serious illness conversations? And so we've got Nurses, physicians, pharmacists, dietitians, social work, spiritual care, unit assistants, administrative ma or managers or educators. And I truly, truly am in a room of the converted. Uh -huh. So essentially it is an interprofessional, um, interprofessional skill and responsibility, including the role of our unit assistant, assistants and administrators and managers and educators to, that help support this process. So I'm just going to end that poll and share those results. So 100% nurses, physicians, pharmacists, yes, most certainly, especially during conversations about uh, deprescription of medications, dietitians all the time around food and fluids social work, I'm going to be sharing a study where social work was one of the major um, uh, clinicians having a serious illness conversation, spiritual care, you know, assistants, administrators, 50%, yes, and educators. So I'll stop sharing that. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is carry on back. Uh, I will be coming to another poll a little bit later, but right now I'll just move back into the, um, so there goes my land acknowledgement. So we'll move through that one. And I keep seeing, I don't know why, but I'm still seeing the poll. I'll just move it out of the way. There we go. So our learning activities, and I apologize if you can hear the dog barking, that's my dog also at the Starbucks with me. So first of all, we're gonna talk about, uh, we, we already reviewed the serious illness conversation questions. And then um, we're gonna talk about, I'm gonna share a recent article that was piloting the serious illness conversation in, in a dialysis unit. And then maybe we'll just think about it a little bit, write a little bit as you're going along, see, think about the tensions and then maybe we can share with a large group. And then we'll talk a little bit in a breakout rooms and then come back um, and share some strategies. And then I'll provide some takeaway points. Whoops. So this was done, uh, this was a, a study and I have to put, uh, this is again, Rachel Bernacki and uh, colleagues uh, who in 2015 uh, decided to, to try it, um, seeing how this worked in a dialysis unit. And so they um, worked in a community dialysis unit. Patients, uh, if you're over 60 years old, you are automatically eligible. And um, if you're under 60, only if a nephrologist answered yes to the surprise question. And um, I thought that that was interesting because it identified one of the many tensions of the serious illness conversation is like, how does it get triggered? And I just wondered if you can just think about that a little bit 
and write down how in your setting, in your dialysis unit, in your clinical setting, how those um, uh, conversations get triggered. And, and maybe I'll give, just give you a 30 seconds or so to just write that down. How do you know it's time? And how, is that systematized or is it just kind of ad hoc? And so what they did was the clinicians um, were trained in a, the typical serious illness conversations training session. Um, they were provided with information on the prognosis of the patient on maintenance dialysis with a, a, a tool called the Cohen model, where they were able to evaluate the six month, 12 month and 18 month mortality scores. But the social work staff, staff if they were the chosen clinician, would not incorporate those time-based progno prognoses into the conversation. And then they were analyzed for themes, um, charts were reviewed for documentation. Did it change the medical orders for scope of treatment? Did it identify a healthcare practitioner or a healthcare representative and, um, uh, and any other information on goals or of care? And so, um, so maybe what I'll, I'll stop here for a second and put up that last poll. Um, where we talk about some of the some of the tensions and just two of which I've identified here is um, identification and prognostication. And just checking, is this the there are many reasons poll or the barriers? The barriers poll, okay. maybe we'll do that one. Okay. There you go. So the barriers to implementing serious illness conversations for patients on dialysis are many, just three that resonate most with you. So lack of clinician time, patient facts, factors of exhaustion or feeling unwell. No one has a designated responsibility, lack of privacy, prognostic paralysis, lack of training, avoid, people prefer to avoid the conversation, culture, both hospital and clinic and societal. Let me give another another 30 seconds or so. We're just about, we've got 80% of people responding. Okay, I'm going to end the poll and share the results. So what I see is that time is a big factor here. And when I think time and patient factors of feeling exhausted and too unwell, um, I would say that that's certainly the case. A lot of times when I pop into, especially the RJH dialysis unit, patients are, where these patients tend to have more complexity, most certainly are sleepy and drowsy and tired. The community dialysis clinics are a wee bit different. People seem to be a bit more interactive and um, sharing more of their lives with the uh, community dialysis um, care providers. The issue of responsibility, Lack of privacy is huge in the dialysis unit. You're like protected by a curtain. That's nothing else unless a, a room is available. Training, avoidance, and culture. So thank you for that. So I'll just move the poll out of the way of my view again. And so what I want to do, first of all, is um, think about the fact that this study used prognosis in terms of time. And because prognostication is our superpower as palliative care clinicians, I, I want you to think a little bit more and as um, anyone who's having a serious illness conversation because so much depends on what the information is that's provided and desired about the future. And so I, I'm hoping in the breakout rooms, we can address two things. One is, when people ask about prognosis or when you share prognosis, what might people want or need to know about the future? So that's the first part of the question. And the second part of the question is, what parts of that information might you and your role be able to provide? And so I think about prognosis in three different ways. And uh, is this time-based? Is this function-based? Is this uncertainty-based? And so um, I'll just ask 
the breakout rooms to start and we'll have those for about seven minutes. Amazing, I love it. So uh, was there anything else in the chat, Tina, to bring oh, out? That was it, yeah. So I'm gonna go into a little bit of information sharing now and, and at the same time, that I learned about the serious illness conversation, there was another young physician um, there named, uh, oh, I can't remember her last name. I had it on here before, but it's come off. And she wrote a couple of articles on what is our role in having these conversations really? What is the function of these conversations? And she leaned into it from uh, the idea of prognostication and uh, awareness, the awareness, that separation, that overlap of holding the understanding of living and, and dying. And it's it's that piece around the seriousness conversation by, by digging into hopes and fears and adaptive coping um, and who is around to support these people. We can talk about hoping for the best, but preparing for the worst. And the language of I hope that uh, you'll continue to live well on dialysis for a long time. It's hard to live with the uncertainty of an illness that often can't be cured. So there's that little shot, that little warning shot of prognostication. Um, when dying is very small in comparison to that piece of living. And then Julia went on to talk about as we're, as we as clinicians, knowing the trajectory of end-stage renal disease and for patients on dialysis or others, we can continue to talk about what makes good living. Um, and because we know them well, and we've had these conversations along the way, it sounds like you're having more trouble getting out to see your friends because you're getting more tired. Well, I'm not going to the church group anymore. My mother-in-law doesn't get out to bridge as much. My father has stopped playing hockey because of his Parkinson's disease. You know, this is disappointing and uh, impacts quality of life. And is it okay if I show you what I've noticed? So here's again, some prognostic sharing. So this is serious illness conversation, but it's enhanced by other communication skills. So, so the serious illness conversation, absolutely you do, and it's got a structure to it, but within it, there's all of these little beautiful tricks that we can use. So I see, I see, you've asked permission, I see you being more tired too, and I can see you are losing weight. I do see this in my patients who've been on dialysis for a while as their illness progresses. Is it okay if we talk about what that means? So it's that constant sharing, that ask, tell, ask skill that's embedded within the serious illness conversation. I hope, here's the uncertainty piece. I hope you will continue to live well as, or, or the functional losses. I hope you will continue to live well for a long time, but I worry that this might be a good, as good as you feel. So here's the functional prognostic statement. And so you can see in this place, as someone is moving along in their illness, the living is still very much there, but the dying is a little bit bigger. It's a little bit more proximate. And then as we have a serious illness conversation, as the person, it's becoming clear to us from our medical lens, our nursing lens, our spiritual care lens as we've gotten to know them, our psychosocial lens as we see them talking about the wondering about dying um, and questions about what it might look like and how is this gonna affect their family, is I think we're in a different place now. And this is a skill called remapping that we do with our patients all the time. And then as we have walked with them from living and dying being quite separated to living and dying coming closer and closer together. We've shepherded them through this process. So that prognostication about dying becomes, a, and the view of dying becomes a little bit easier to bear. So we engage with patients to talk about the possibility of dying at some time in the future. We use the, the phrase dying time. This Della Roberts, who now works at the BC Centre, taught me that phrase. And everyone now attributes it to me. And I keep saying, no, no, it's Della's words. At some time in the future, allows a relatively healthy patient to come to terms with the idea before crisis forces proximity. And to me, this is one of the keys and the beauties of the superpower of prognostication language embedded within the serious illness conversation. So as we move along in the pilot study, um, I think this is very interesting. Can you see my little pointer, Tina? 
I just nod or shake your head. As yeah. yeah. So you can see that they deemed 126 people were um, identified. Then 62 were eligible. So they were over 60 or the surprise under 60 in the surprise question said, yes, they, they, they may die in the next 12 months. They screened, they pre-screened 46 of them, but 30 declined. And I think that's really interesting because it speaks to what? I mean, this this is within this study here, we could have probably five different echoes to talk about that patient culture and the patient willingness to open up or their perception of where they're at with their illness and is this time or how we identify them or how we invite them for we're lost to follow up. They died basically before the end of the illness. The average age was getting on towards 70 to we're at 60. Uh, kind of a skewed population. So you think about, you know, how generalizable is this, is this study, a high level of education, mostly white and divided amongst other races, mostly men, two thirds of them. And interestingly, their time on dialysis had been quite a long time. And I think this speaks a little bit to Lawrence's point too, is that these people can be on dialysis for long periods of time. And when we think about different phases of illness, you can have your stable phase of illness, your unstable phase of illness, or your deteriorating phase of illness. And many of these patients were in a very stable phase of illness, which is actually a really nice time to have these conversations before so that it's not so bumpy and, and decisions and shared decision-making isn't influenced by fear and uncertainty um, uh, and uh, the chaos of transitions. So most of these had fistulas. They were in community rather than uh, more uh, higher intense um, dialysis. Most of them had the etiology caused by high blood pressure and diabetes. And most of them had quite a long predicted mortality. And I was it really, really bugs me that they only focused on a time-based prognostication. So, so this is a, a tension that I identified in this study was that people want to know exactly what you guys identified. They want to know the prognosis of how am I going to feel? What is my experience going to be like? Who's going to look after me? Who's going to look after my family? What is the death going to look like? But in this study, because they needed to keep it tight, and I think because of the culture of the dialysis unit, just reading through the lines, they needed to stick with just a time-based uh, mortality prediction. So most of them were in a private room, which was noted to be a little bit tricky to arrange. Three of them were in the dialysis chair with the curtains drawn, uh, so not hugely private. They had trouble recruiting clinicians to do this. Mostly social workers, three um, primary nephrologists, and four of the conversations were held by a nephrologist palliative care uh, champion. So of course, again, this is not very generalizable because not everybody has a palliative care nephrologist. Like we have Dr. Hardgrove over here, who's very skilled at these conversations. Um, and uh, But not everybody has the benefit of that. 20 minutes on average. My average is about 14 minutes um, uh, for conversations. Um, uh, I'm getting uh, tighter with it. Um, uh, sometimes they can last as long as 45 minutes. And the percentage of documentation, which they said was very good, was 75%. I said, that's dreadful. You should be documenting every ACP <laughs> conversation that you have. And in BC, we're very lucky that we have our ACP power form. I don't know how widespread this is, but there's actually a spot in our, our record where the serious illness conversation is documented. And um, while it can, some people think it's a bit cumbersome, I think it's a beautiful thing. And I love to watch the arc of the serious illness over time as it people's uh, illness changes and their um, and, and their goals of care uh, change and their their fears, et cetera, change and hopes change. So how much did they, it was the, just the right of information for a third of people too much for 42%. And this, I'm curious why it felt like too much. And the, I remember how I, t I showed you in the, in those pieces where death and living was a little bit far away and then became closer, how there's the ask, tell, ask embedded within the serious illness conversation. I think this is how you make sure you're not giving too much is a constant checking in before you move on. And I'm sorry, this is turning into something very didactic, but anyway, it is what it is. The timing was just right. And most people, at least a little worthwhile, I thought, well, that's kind of like 
I, I can only imagine what question they ask. A little worthwhile, slightly worthwhile, very worthwhile. So they've skewed it to get their 91%. Um, and this is what I found when we did a, a our, um, what we when we did our little uh, quality improvement project in the dialysis unit at RGH, is that people were kind of, because they were mostly in the stable phase of illness, they were like, Man, it was okay to have this conversation. Whereas when someone who's a cancer, on the cancer trajectory that's changing so quickly, they're like, thank you for having this conversation with me. I had lots of informational needs and, and anxiety changes significantly. This was not such an issue for the uh, patients with renal disease. I'm trying to find my thing. Okay, so they pulled out a few themes. Understanding of illness, dialysis as temporary, either... I know that it's not gonna last forever, so I'm actually willing to put up with a lot. I'm gonna get better. I'm gonna go from this intensive home dialysis to a smaller machine and do home dialysis, and I'm gonna be able to travel. Um, I want a transplant. So dialysis as temporary was a very uh, common theme. Um, that patients compartmentalize their disease. The dialysis becomes, because they've lived with it for so long, um, it, they're not really seeing it as their main problem. It's my COPD that's the problem. It's the um, uh, my heart that's the problem. So this was said very, very often from uh, various patients. And I'm just going to quickly go through this narrowing of life experiences. And we see this with all kinds of chronic health conditions. For example, with COPD, I'm out and I'm uh, in sorry about my dog, engaging in, in life and experiences and I'm hiking and then I'm just able to go do the necessities of shopping and now I can't get out of my house and now I'm stuck to this machine at home and I'm afraid to go out and I'm too tired to go out. So the narrowing and narrowing of life experiences and this, I've always considered myself a dependable person. It's it, existential changes in the sense of who they are and what they used to do. And, and dialysis is seen as a as uh, not really a choice, but a default. It's either hospice, death, or dialysis. And many patients do uh, express regret um, uh, after having gone on dialysis, but they just kind of, again, I'll just carry on because it's temporary. So I thought that was really interesting. And then the impact of conversations in this study was interesting. All they looked at was the ACP, mostly. So most pulsed, and it had no effect on the most of pulse documentation. So to me, that speaks that we've had these conversations, but there's no system in place to support what it's supposed to do, which is one of the main reasons is to inform shared decision-making and advanced care planning. And, but, but they did identify healthcare proxies, three, uh, eight out of the 12 compared to five out of 12. And so when I reflected on this, I thought, uh, maybe I'll just throw it out there to you guys right now before I share my thoughts in, in our last kind of 10 minutes or so. With this study, I I, I had a, a few thoughts about what it showed me about the serious illness conversation and how it can be used in um, end of life or how it should be used and where the barriers are. But I wonder what your thoughts are about this study in particular and having these conversations in the dialysis population. Christine, it's Gaylene Hargrove here. I'm Gaylene. so hi. I'm so sorry to have um, logged in late, but um, I, I thought I would weigh in um, just, you know, as you've spoken, just prompting me to reflect on why prognostication is really hard. Um, well, it, it's because we're bad at it, for lack of a <laughs> better, I mean, um, studies, although not robust, all of them suggest that it might as well be the flip of a coin if you want to put a number on it. Excellent point. Uh, um, I, I actually, case in point is, a, you know, a patient I was just like not long ago, moments ago, literally interacting with um, type 1 diabetes for 42 years. And um, 
other patients that I've had of that vintage, if you will, um, with type one diabetes, they were informed that um, they wouldn't live past 50. Well, um, <laughs> this patient, I was, uh, you know, just having a discussion with is uh, 70. And, and yes, there's a fork in the road um, about to initiate dialysis. But um, these were my words here. I said, I'm so glad the physicians that put a number on your life were wrong. And um, I no longer put a number on things. Um, I will give kind of a um, an approximate spectrum maybe if you will if if I'm really pushed to it um put to task by patients but I more and more am focusing on quality of life and what and trying to get at what matters most to them um and then get it you know that is what matters most is kind of built into the serious illness conversation um and you can take a, a sort of sidestep from that. And it, what's also important is to identify what's their worst fear. Um, what is it like, what abilities can you absolutely not live with not having um, that's intolerable to you? Yesterday, um, patient I was seeing for the first time um, said, just put it right out there. I am definitely afraid of a stroke. I cannot not cannot be more debilitated than I am now in her words so um I'll just I'll close it off there because I don't want to monopolize the conversation but those those are just um thoughts about why it is um that it's perhaps difficult with such a time-based study um that is limiting in terms of um, trying, trying to actually see quote positive results. If if what we're talking about positive results is to, um, you know, get more most decisions or, um, because that's that's not necessarily what the goal of the patient is at that particular time. Yes, thank thank you for saying that so eloquently, uh, Gaylene. And this is why I see people not want uh, inter professionals who are not physicians saying, I don't feel comfortable because of the prognosis piece. And yet when, you know, we, we talked about, you know, what is it that people really want or need to know that will help with our shared decision-making? It's not time. It can be, but it seems to be that is where we have lent in, leaned into as a medical culture is to talk about the time but when you ask patients what matters most it's often not the time and so it's often in areas that physicians are actually less qualified to lean into like what's going to happen to my family am I going to be abandoned I'm not my existential self that I um, have known myself to be and so, and what's going to happen to that existential self as I move through this illness. And so it requires, requires our interprofessional team to engage with those conversations around prognostication of function, of spirit, of psychosocial, as well as of medical and of time. So, so that's my, um, my take home. And we have, I, I just, um, yeah, so I'll just leave it there. So, so what I'm I'm saying is, what matters most is important. How do we work to our scope so that patients can live to their scope as close to their ideals as possible? So that's sort of my rounding it out. And we have like three minutes for some last questions. I I don't know if we cut off right at the two o'clock mark, but I'm I'm happy to stay for a little while longer. It's a beautiful day. I'm sitting here listening to music and talking with you all. So I'm happy to stay for a little while as long as people want to chat. And I've just popped into the chat a link to our survey. We'll send out an email about that as well. But if you could take some time to copy that 
that link into your browser bar and, and uh, it'll only take you a couple minutes to complete the survey on today's session. We'd appreciate that. Um, and yeah, we can we can stay on as long as there's questions, whatever folks like. Or or comments or sharing. And and if there aren't, then I have a few questions I can throw out there to ask specifically. Um, Ken writes, if patients ask about time, I will sometimes ask them, what would you do differently if you had one to three months versus six to 10 months? This can get way. what is important to them. Oh, I like it. So it's that ask, tell, ask frame, isn't it? It's that um, staying curious. And, and sometimes I'll say things like, um, that's a really... A question I often get asked, and it's an important one. And 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 depending on how I've had a rapport, I might say, "Have you got something in, inside of you that tells you how things are going?" Or maybe I might ask them what they understand. Um, I might ask them. Uh, I said, "I want to talk about that, but tell me what is it that feels important to know about time." Um, and and so it's that continuous instead of me talking a lot like I'm doing now is is I do spend a lot of time in silence in these conversations just lobbing those questions creating silence and just waiting to see how that silence gets filled do you have a question for you can you speak yes. a little more about the Cohen model oh Gaylene can you help with that <laughs> Gaylene, are you still on? The Cohen, the Cohen model. So there's all kinds of prognostication models. Um, and um, those Cohen model, I'm not as familiar with, but what I understand is it takes a number of different diseases and it takes some um, biochemical parameters and it plugs it into a equa equation that purports to spit out uh, estimated prognosis for a patient. That, um, that's right, Christine. I'm yeah. sorry. I was having technology <laughs> issues. No, I'm okay. still here. Um, it's a it is, um, it uses actually, um, smaller number of variables than the Charleston comorbidity index. Um, so we think we used to think it was, um, a little bit more, if you will, um, uh, more streamlined or sleeker because there weren't so many different comorbidities to consider. But what it does consider is um, whether it's age, um, serum albumin, which the, the only um, biochemical variable that we measure um, is serum albumin that is consistently um, uh, related to um lifespan. So the lower your albumin, the, the lower your survival on dialysis. Um, and, and that, that in and of itself is a bit of a loaded variable because it's, uh, not just a marker of nutrition, but also, um, it drops if, if you have chronic systemic inflammation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, malignancy, um, those sorts of things, uh, and stage liver disease. So um, also presence of peripheral arterial disease, um, dementia, um, and I'm just trying, there's, I think, five for sure different variables. But what we did find as a group, we, we actually published on this, um, Oh goodness, uh, members within our palliative care committee, BC Renal Palliative Care Committee, Brian Forsley was um, a keynote author there um, from the interior. He um, found, and, and thanks to our methodologists, um, that there was poor correlation with what the Cohen model, which was actually validated in an American dialysis population, that there was poor correlation with um, the finding, the reported uh, prognostication using that model versus what actually happened. And I bet, thank you, Gaylene. And I bet you, if you, we, when you talk about correlations, how does it correlate with patient experience and what matters most to patients? So, I, you know, I feel like they had to include this because it was at a very high level um, 
academic hospital so that they had to have something that was validated but i i feel like it it that finding those prognose prognostic scores were actually not really helpful to the patients that's probably why they were like meh it didn't help didn't hurt it was okay here's a teaser for future echoes and, and maybe a and uh hoping that we can think about how we can improve the quality of conversations and we Galen and I were involved with this together um, and this was one of the posters that came out of it because we asked the interprofessional team um, how they thought we could improve these conversations in the dialysis unit and all of the things that came up around that you guys came up with was time training um, patient factors trying to catch them when they were there uh, with when when the conversations when the opportunities presented themselves as opposed to this big formal conversation and so it's a little challenge and i may be um saying something that's rather controversial because the serious illness conversation does have a beautiful arc but what the rgh team did was they said what parts of this conversation can i own can i bring to the interprofessional conversations my understanding of the patient's fears and worries because i asked them about that last week uh, but I had a, so the uh, nutritionist had a conversation about um, the critical abilities and the pharmacists talked to them about what they were willing to go through for the possibility of more time. And so we come together as a team that is able to fill out this beautiful arc of knowledge that's important to have shared decision making with the patient and family and to understand their adaptive coping, et cetera. And they actually took some of those elements of the serious illness conversation and put it in their care planning. I don't know if it's still being used, Gailene, because <laughs> I had to take some time off work to look after my daughter. So I, I kind of lost the stream of it. But I have seen the poster put up in various places in the renal department. And I have actually seen the care planning document where fears and worries, understanding, trade-offs are actually listed on the care plan and people would write it and it's probably it's probably electronic now but so that that was that that was an interesting part that we found was that the the interprofessional staff thought I can't sit down and have the full arc of this conversation but I can own pieces of it So we are a little bit over time. Thank you yep. for those that could stay. We know you all have very, very busy clinical lives. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Jones for, for leading this today. I think that it was it was a good experience for everyone. I love that you gave me a sneaky suggestion for an idea for a future echo. So I will be following <laughs> up with you on that. Great. <laughs> it's very uh, uh, self-promoting. Yeah. But anyway, I'll do, I'm, I'm not above that. Yeah, great. <laughs> Uh, we are planning to do another SAC Echo in uh, September for folks and another one in November, but that doesn't mean we couldn't sneak one in in October as well. So thank you to everyone for attending today and uh, hopefully we'll see you again at the next one.